Please rise as you are able, face the back as we join in our Palm Sunday processional, which is found on the bulletin insert. Come, gather together, it is time. The time is now, the king is here. The time of God's choosing, the king of all nations. The king is Christ Jesus. Our savior, our redeemer. The Palm Sunday processional gospel according to Mark. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing? Untie the colt. They told them that Jesus had said, and they were allowed them to take it. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Here ends the Holy Gospel. Open the gates of righteousness that we may open the gate of the Lord. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Rejoice, oh, oh. Rejoice and be glad. Ha <laughs> ha. Join the festal procession. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes. Let us now raise our palms and welcome Jesus not only into our worship, but into our lives.
welcome as we gather at the beginning of this holy week to welcome Jesus into our presence and recall God's love for us. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Sovereign God, you have established your rule in the human heart through the servanthood of Jesus Christ. By your spirit, keep us in the joyful procession of those who with their tongues confess Jesus as Lord and with their lives praise him as Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading for Palm Sunday comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, beginning with the fifth verse. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here ends the first reading.
It is a blessing here to have our bell choir. Thank you so much for sharing your rendition of that hymn that I think we, we recognize a little bit. Huh. Given the length of today's gospel lesson, I invite you to remain seated and to strike a posture that allows you to fully listen to the story of Jesus. The Holy Gospel, according to Mark, it was two days before the Passover and the festival of the unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the festival or there may be a riot among the people. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar, a very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was the ointment wasted uh, in this way? For the ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a great service for me. For you will always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance to, of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And when they had taken their places and began eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and say to him, one after another, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to the one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never drink of the vine of the fruit until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. 
He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were abandoned? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. They took Jesus to the high priest. And all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. For many gave false testimony against him. And their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple, that it is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, why do we still need witnesses? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. The guards also took him over and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you are talking about. And he went out into the forecourt. Then the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. Then after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse, and he swore an oath, I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. As soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priest accused him of many things. Pilate again asked him, have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone of whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison. 
with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he asked them, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Pilate asked them again, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace that is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole cohort and they clothed him in purple cloak. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him and they began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews. They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stirred up, stripped off the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him, they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sakbatani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. They used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him, whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen cloth and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that he had then hewn out of rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid. This is the word of God the word of life. Well, grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I have a feeling 
there are a few people in this room right now wondering, Pastor, why did you just read to us for 15 minutes? If you've been at Good Shepherd for a while, you know normally we cut down those readings to keep the service in under an hour. However, as I read this passage today, there's something interesting that requires the fullness of the story in order to be understood. Because this, this story, along with changing from reading just a small excerpt to reading the whole thing, has a significant about face. Are you familiar with this term? It's used mostly in military practices. About face, meaning turning 180 degrees. So turning from full left to full right, or turning around and going back in the direction from which you came. And if you were listening in the gospel reading, you hear about face after about face after about face after about face. There are so many significant 180 degree changes that happen in this gospel lesson. We have the processional gospel with shouts of Hosanna's turn to shouts of crucify him, all within the manner of a week. We find a woman who has saved a jar of nard worth a year's worth of, of funding and of work, saving it up, choosing to then pour it all out onto Jesus. Quite a drastic change. We hear of Judas, a follower of Jesus over multiple years, change and pull an about face as he betrays Jesus. We find Peter, the rock upon which the church will be built, denying Jesus in front of others in order to save himself. We find the Pharisees and the priests. If you read the whole Gospel of Mark, you find out that the Pharisees and priests, they're afraid of Jesus on and on throughout the gospel. But now all of a sudden they're bold and they're making accusations in front of Jesus. Yes, a complete about face. And then we have Barabbas, this guy who's been condemned, being freed. A drastic 180 degree change. And then Simon, Simon's this poor guy, he's just coming in from Jer to Jerusalem from the country. And here is Jesus being led away by the centurions and them recognizing that Jesus can't carry the cross. So they're like, hey, you, buddy, take the cross, turn right around, and you're carrying it. I always feel a little bad for him, don't you? 180 degree change. And then we get Jesus, the son of man in exalted place, turning to feeling forsaken. Jesus, one so full of life, who gives up his spirit on the cross and his lifeless body laid in a tomb. It's a lot of drastic about faces and changes in the story of this holy week. And it's nothing that we're unfamiliar with for our lives bring similar changes. That person who was a great friend then betrays your trust and becomes a bit of an adversary or, or at least untrustworthy. That job that seems like it's on stable footing and that you've had for years, but then all of a sudden there comes this term downsizing. Yeah, we're accustomed to so many about face changes in our world. Living means that we're going to encounter them. And some, some we have control over. I think of the woman with the perfume who chooses to use this perfume to anoint Jesus. I think of Peter, who in the moment can say, yes, I am he, I know this Jesus, but instead chooses to deny him. Just like you and me, we have agency. We get to exercise our own choices. We get to, to choose, to choose what to take up or to give up during this Lenten season. It's almost over. You can go back to eating chocolate soon. I think of myself. I can choose to ramble on and give a full sermon, or I can choose to shorten it and have it be a homily. What do you want? I know the answer already. But then there are other things that we don't have any choice over. No, I think of here, for instance, Simon and Barabbas. Simon, who's just heading into town, and then they're like, no, you've got to carry this cross out of town, or we're going to take it out on you, and you don't want to mess with Rome. He didn't exactly have a choice. Barabbas, Barabbas, 
He was condemned to death. He didn't have anything to do with his own freedom. Not a bit. I think of us. The weather has been gorgeous. We don't control it, right? The other day, I think we had three seasons all in one day. We don't control that, do we? We don't control also how other people necessarily feel. It's a challenge. I talk to so many who say, oh, I wish somebody just felt this way or felt that way. And it's like, you can, you can do some things, but you can't choose to, on how they feel. You don't have control over that. So many things in this world that we don't have control over. But then there's a, some things that are a little bit of a combination of both. You see that in Jesus. He knew what was coming, but yet he exercised his free will in graciously giving of himself for our sake, for the sake of you and me. And likewise, there are things that we have don't control fully, but control a little. For instance, I know the schools, you're all on spring break this week, right? Local ones are. We can't control when spring break is, can we? But we can control what we do with it. Likewise, I think of what I've been going through the past few months. I I'm trying to create an environment where I heal as best and as efficiently as I can. But you know what? I can't control bone growing. Not a power that I have. There are so many things in this world that we see change. Some that we have control over. Some we don't have control over. And some that there's a mixture of things we control and we don't control. And that is called life. <laughs> That is called life. So how do we navigate all this change, all this abrupt 180 degree shift? Well, I think there's two practical things that we can draw from. The first is written on a cross that hangs in my office. In fact, the words are probably quite familiar to you. They say, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the strength to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. It's commonly called the serenity prayer, attributed to Reinhold Niebuhr. And I find it filled with such wisdom because as we come in our world and experience changes, we have to take stock of what is it that I'm in control of? What is it that I have power of? And what can I do? And recognize that in our own humanness, there are some things we don't control as we continue to ask God for that wisdom. And then reminded of one other thing, and it's from the reading that you gave, Edith, where it says, let every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I like that passage because it doesn't say, let every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord as long as everything is going my way. Let every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord as long as the person I want wins the election. Let every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord as long as I wake up and I hit all the green lights going to work. No, because the truth is that we are to recognize that Jesus Christ as Lord is not a conditional statement, but is one that applies to each and every moment, regardless of what change might occur in our own lives. To ground ourselves in the truth and hope found in the gospel today of Jesus who goes before us, sacrificing himself that we might have hope now and always. Hope within every moment. Hope despite any change. So as we continue to live and encounter the changes that occurred around us and in our world and in our lives, may we do so assured that Jesus Christ is Lord, now, tomorrow, and always. And may we continue to search, to search for the serenity of understanding those things that we cannot change. Seeking out God's wisdom and strength in changing the things that we can and continuing to rest on the wisdom that Jesus Christ offers us, inviting us to see the difference that we may enter every week, not just Holy Week, uplifted and strengthened by the way in which God comes to us 
now and always, regardless of any about face. Amen. When we gather as a church, we pray for the world, for the work of God in every time and place, and for all those in need. We pray especially for those on our prayer list and add to that those who continue to live with the warfare and violence in Gaza and Ukraine. We pray for those who are mourning, especially for the family and friends of Billy June Dennis, who is the mother of Kathy Johnson. As always, we pray and give thanks for those who serve our country and communities. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and the world in need. Blessed one, today the church sings glad hosannas as we enter Holy Week. Gather your people here in Coronationville and in all places around the cross and comfort us with resurrection hope. Hear us, O God. Renew your good creation and protect the balance of life on earth. Encourage all who work to restore your creation and help us to be mindful of our call to steward what you have provided. Hear us, O God. Establish peace and justice among the nations. Grant that courts, legislatures, and local governments will serve with integrity and compassion. Gift the leaders and servants of our community and nation with your strength and your wisdom, uniting them around your will. Hear us, O God. Bring hope to any who feel forsaken or forgotten. Make a way for refugees, asylum seekers, the incarcerated, the institutionalized, and all who are grieving or ill. Especially, we pray for Ed, Kim, Carol, Kathleen, Nicole, Scott, Marilyn, Jurgen, Grant, Bill, Nancy, Barry, Sue, Georgia, Bill, Jane, Howard, Tom, Archie, Cameron, Greg, Kathy, Stella, Diane, Mike, Katie, June, James, Stephen, Gavin, Michelle, Kevin, Mary, Shirley, Mary, Howard, Dan, those in Gaza and Ukraine, and the family and friends of Billy, that they may know your love. Hear us, O God. 
Give energy and joy to our pastors, deacons, worship leaders, and musicians. Watch over those who travel. Hear us, O God. Blessed one, your, our times are in your hand. Sustain us in discipleship throughout our lives and receive us into everlasting life. Hear us, O God. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share that peace with those around you. O God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end bring all the world to your feast through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Gather together, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me for the closing liturgy found in your bulletin insert. Stay here and watch. Stay here and pray. Stay here and watch. Stay here and pray. For the cornerstone is shaped. Stay here and watch. Stay here and pray. Stay here and watch. Stay here and pray. Thus, you shall be prepared to rejoice in God's salvation. Amen.